All right, Ninjaga Crystallized is over. And I know some of you might be curious to hear my thoughts on the season and the upcoming series in 2023. So today I want to talk about the season as a whole, as well as specific characters like the Ninja, the Overlord, Pixel, Rumi, Garmadon, Wu, Crystal Council, etc. And what's next for the franchise as a whole. So let's go. So, some of my main theories from both my Crystallized Predictions video and the 12 Endings video were right. The ninja and their allies fought the Vengeance Army together, there was a final battle 2.0, Harumi redeems herself in the end, and surprise surprise, the Crystal King is in fact the Overlord. And to add to that, when the Crystallized episodes were streaming at the end of September, I got a flow of notifications from you guys telling me that the Overlord was in fact responsible for the Great Devourer corrupting Garmadon. It was I who possessed the serpent that bit your hand. Ah! It was I who corrupted the Great Devourer and set him against you. In the end, I personally believe that the Overlord played a hand in Garmadon's corruption and used him in an attempt to divide his family. My jaws and eyes were wide open during that bombshell. And while we're on that subject, I see that comment joking about me predicting the future. And to that, maybe I did. Or maybe I have some connections within the story group. <laughs> Just kidding. I honestly had no idea what was going to happen, and I didn't even expect it to happen, which made that reveal so memorable to me. I also had a lot of people telling me that I was wrong about the Overlord not being an Oni, and I was a little bit on the fence going into part 2. But apparently, a lot of you trusted Garmadon's theory, which is often fine. The only thing that can destroy the Overlord is the power of the Oni. I'm sure you all are going to give me a hard time about the ninja retiring since that was my biggest prediction going in, but hey, it doesn't hurt to dream. Tell me you haven't seen a theory way more outlandish than the ones I make. But I didn't walk into Crystallize hoping that my theories would come true. Because let's be honest, not every plot point is going to line up with what we want to see happen. And if you come into stories with the wildest theories and expect them to happen, chances are you've set yourself up for disappointment. The way I go into TV shows and movies does not hinge on any plot theories or expectations for how the story should play out. My only expectation going in is, will I be entertained? And doing that and shoving every theory or prediction in the back of my head allows me to have a good experience. And I can recognize the flaws, but I won't let them bother me as much. That might work for some, not for others, but that's how I roll. Now onto the season itself. Was Crystallized a satisfying conclusion, or was it a disappointment? Well, let's get the criticisms out of the way first. Some of the dialogue can be a bit clunky and eye rolly at times. The ending was also, dare I say, a tad bit anticlimactic. The final fight between the dragon forms and the overlord, well, visually entertaining, but it was a bit too fast and everyone walks out with no consequences. Like nobody dies or gets trapped in some sort of purgatory. Harumi doesn't even face the consequences for what she's done. If you say something is going to be the conclusion to the current saga, chances are that there is going to be some loss, or at the very least a passing of the torch, which is what I predicted would happen. Aside from the Vengestone and Overlord arc, there were some things that were set up in part 1 that kind of just dropped in part 2. The ninja were literally at odds with the new ninja and mere trustable in the first half, but then the second half just brushes that aside and doesn't even follow through with that arc. More on that later. And because of that, the stakes were kind of lost on me and the finale felt a little too clean for my liking. Now, maybe it's because Seabound had a melancholy ending and the creators decided not to repeat that same trope, or because they thought fans, which are mostly kids, might have reacted negatively to a sadder ending. But again, if you market the season as a big conclusion to everything that's come before, the general belief is that you're going to take some risks, such as saying goodbye to the protagonists, while getting us ready to follow a new series with different characters. And because of that, I could not help but feel that the writers were either holding back and didn't take enough risks, or they were originally intending to make a sadder ending but were forced to change it in post. I don't know if that's true, but it feels like it is. And that's really my biggest complaint about the season. The ending felt a bit misleading and kind of underwhelming. Yeah, maybe they still have plans for the ninja in the future, or it's because I based my expectations on how Avengers Endgame and The Rise of Skywalker ended their respective sagas. But it's fine. 
the more it sits with me, the more I'll accept it. And I'm not saying the ending we got was complete garbage. I was just expecting more impactful consequences. Another big issue was continuity mistakes that seemed to contradict or ignore previous story material, like Lloyd looking down on the entire Oni race but forgot about Mistake, or Wu calling the dragon armor the golden armor, or Cole referring to Vanya as princess, princess. instead of queen. But for me, the biggest outlier was when Garmadon didn't even mention his adventures in Two Moon Village from his solo comic series. Which, by the way, is canon and I highly recommend you read them if you haven't. And because of that, it's apparent that the story group didn't really consult with the writers about any other story material or vice versa. Had they animated a few moments from that comic into the episode, or at least mentioned Two Moon Village, it would have flowed better and even motivate more fans to read the comics. This is nothing new. Crystallize isn't the only season to have some continuity errors or soft retcons. I mean, look at the Serpentine history, for example. But it's apparent that the relationship between the story group and writers still needs to improve. So glossing over a few existing story material made it feel like the writers were either deliberately rushing through so much plot or were under intense pressure by the studio, which really hurts and is a problem that every other studios like Fox, Sony, and sometimes Disney don't seem to understand. Let the writers and filmmakers do their job and worry about your own. Worry about the production and distribution, not the story. And speaking of distribution, I am very disappointed with the way LEGO had handled the releasing of Crystallize. I have no idea what was going on, but they really need to get their act together. Even Tommy himself was pissed off with LEGO and I feel really bad for the guy. Other complaints I have are relatively minor. If I had to stretch the Crystal Council, the c started to feel a tad out of place in the second half and we're kind of just there. I have nice things to say about them, but my one and only gripe is that their personalities and interactions kind of clashed with the perceived seriousness of the story. The Overlord is a very serious dude, and their quick defeats also reminded me of Day of the Departed. Cringe. I said before that part 1 set up a few plot points that kind of went nowhere in part 2, more on that later. Oni Lloyd was cool, but the execution left a little to be desired. Most of the characters in the final fight didn't utter a single word which was disappointing. I felt that the Quanish prophecy was unnecessary for them to achieve dragon form since there was no prophecy to achieve oni form. It just felt way too convenient and I didn't really like it. I mean, I love the maneuvering, the whole jump up, kick back, whip around and spin maneuver and the dragon form itself. It's just the prophecy portion of it I have an issue with. I also felt the season kind of struggled to balance that darker, apocalyptic, world-ending tone with the show's familiar, campy, and kid-friendly comedy, so certain jokes didn't land the way they were intended. And then to speedrun my other issues, there were a few insufferable characters, certain choices that annoyed me, the whole powerless arc feeling stale, and some moments that kind of dragged on or maybe just rolled my eyes. And that's just about it. I loved everything else. The season really shook me on the shoulders and screamed, THIS IS NINJAGO! The story, for the most part, was great. The animation was really good. The voice acting has been phenomenal. The sound design is incredible. The score, oh, the score is so beautiful. Jay Vincent and Michael Kramer really outdid themselves, and the visuals were just jaw-dropping. I really felt that the production put into making this season was through the roof. Compared to older seasons, this is probably the most beautiful looking one I've ever seen, especially when the city was crystallized. That pink and purple monochromatic atmosphere and the camera movements really felt like we were in the middle of an apocalypse. The action was also very intense. My favorite action scenes being Wu and Garmadon and Lloyd fighting the Crystal King, and the entire high sequence had me on the edge of my seat. Most importantly, I have to praise the cast and the characters they portrayed. Every voice actor brought their A-game this time around. Sam Vincent, Vincent Tong, Andrew Francis, Michael Adamthwaite, Brent Miller, Paul Dobson, Kelly Metzger, Jennifer Hayward, Mark Oliver, Scott McNeil, Britt McKillop, Kathleen Barr, Devin Mack, Michael Dobson, Heather Dorgensen, just everyone was awesome. I genuinely felt every pained outburst from both Sam and Michael. Plants don't count! Plants aren't people! They don't have feelings. It doesn't care that you abandoned it, or that you never sent it a birthday card, or... or... What's the point? You'll never understand. Scott is, as always, terrifying as the Overlord, and Kirby Morrow is irreplaceable, but I think Andrew Francis really surprised me as Cole. I can't give praise to every character, let alone extensively, because this video would be ridiculously long, but to speedrun, the mayor and the ninja were pretty flashy and you're meant to hate them, but they served as interesting foils for the ninja, even though I was bummed that they were taken off pretty quickly. I see a lot of potential for them in future stories. 
I'm starting to hate them. I enjoyed how Aspira was pivotal to bringing Mia back and the mechanic being chased around by the ninja, but I was kind of hoping that they, along with Vangelis, Pythor, and Mr. F had more to do, especially in part 2, but hopefully we'll see more of them in the future. Apparently spending 30 episodes works much better than 40 minutes. The Venstone army also looked extremely cool. Using a power negating mineral to create an army is a very smart choice. And finally, lays to rest the age old question, who is the buyer and why is he or she doing this? And turning people into crystal zombies? That's like every zombie movie ever, and I love it. Speaking of villains, the Overlord was the perfect choice for this final season, fight me. He is and always has been written to be the symbol of evil. The way he just plays off every villain and manipulates them, first with Garmin on and then the so endearing to watch. Even though they didn't do a whole lot with both of them, it was fun to see Skylar back as a team player, and I will always love Pixel. I love the decision to give Garmadon, Wu, and Harumi full story arcs in this season. The same can be said for Nia. Her return took some getting used to, and the powerless arc is done to death, but I think her struggle and eventual return to being Samurai X was enough to make it stay interesting. Zane and Kai are apparently the trickiest ninja to write, but I appreciate how they highlighted Kai's reaction to Nia's departure, and I genuinely hope Zane gets more depth and more focus moving forward. Cole and Jay are the hearts of the team, and I love how Cole is the one that brings them back together, and Jay is like the hermit since it makes sense considering what he's lost. Lloyd's emotional struggle is always relatable. He deals with so much, and I'm surprised he hasn't seen a therapist about it. And his bantering with Harumi and Garmadon was always funny. Dude, I can only imagine what Lloyd Rumi would be like if they're an old married couple. <laughs> the chemistry between the actors is just mwah. Reminds me of Hobbs and Shaw. All right then. No, that's my door. Pick another door. What's wrong with you? You can get off me now. I'm not on you. You're on me. The rest of the cast was amazing, and boy was it a huge cast, which can be tough to manage, but they've done it before, and the Avengers movies are knocking it out of the park with that. But I was a little bummed that we didn't get to hear some of the Resistance members utter a single word. I was pretty confused why we didn't see any Elemental Masters, or why Nia introduced Okino when he could have done that himself. I'm sure there were a lot of Benthamar and Vanya fans who were left wanting. But I'll chalk that up to scheduling conflicts or the people behind the recording booth just didn't have enough room to put in every voice actor. Either way, I think they did their best to incorporate almost every character without overshadowing the main ones. On the surface, one of the main themes in the season and the franchise as a whole is about balance or dualism. Good versus evil, creation versus destruction, light versus darkness. Garmadon believes that Oni power is the only way to defeat the Overlord, but they later use dragon power instead. Lloyd struggles to balance his emotional baggage with Harumi, Garmadon, and his friends. And one of his greatest fears is that he'll become like his father, and Harumi continuously goads him into embracing his darker side, and when Garmadon plays dead, Lloyd crosses the line but is able to bounce back in the end. Another example is the ninja's relationship with the new ninja and each other. After Nia's departure, they struggle to reunite and work as a team, and thus they become dysfunctional, not only against the bad guys, but also internally. Jay is depressed about Nia's loss, which annoys Kai, but they are content with facing the consequences after they do bring her back. Then, stepping over to the dark side, we have the Overlord, who is the antithesis to Balance, as he believes, or claims, that Balance only creates conflict and destruction. His goal, while completely bonkers, is to destroy it and achieve peace if darkness rules over all. Whether the Overlord genuinely believes that Balance creates destruction, or he uses that logic to manipulate the is a mystery, but he has always been portrayed as a being of imbalance. Another big theme is that power is never truly gone. The Powerless Arc is the epitome of that lesson. Nia is restored to human form and is powerless for a while, but she slowly becomes the Warden Ninja again. The Golden Weapons were thought to be depowered, but were later used to restore the Overlord to her corporeal form, and were also used to form the Golden Four-Headed Dragon. The ninja also lose their powers in the end, but they'll more likely gain them back by 2023. And I'll forgive them if they're completely back to normal for the next year, but hey, maybe new writers it wouldn't hurt to wipe their slate completely clean? Who knows? Another example of that theme is that the ninja are starting to lose their respect with the citizens after the new ninjas start butting in. And so obviously they lose that bit of respect and influence over them for a bit, and they're even taken to prison. 
But then over time, after they start risking their necks to save everyone, they regain that power. The whole powerless arc has been done to death multiple times, but they lampshade it a bit here and it works for the story. But now, stepping back into criticisms a bit, let's talk a bit about the season's setups and payoffs. While I was watching the episode where the Vengestone army was attacking the city, I thought in the back of my mind that the ninja would form an uneasy alliance with the new ninja and eventually get back on Mira Trustable's good side at least as much as possible to tie up that loose end. Just that one loose end needed to be tied up. But the Mira and the new ninja get crystallized immediately and we don't see them again until we rebuild the monastery. I was a bit annoyed by that because part one had all this build up with the old butting heads with the mare, but not really doing much with that. I realized that there was still a lot going on, an army of Vengestone warriors being led by the devil who's ushering in the apocalypse would take precedence over a rivalry with would-be replacements, but if you spend so much time comparing which group breaks more stuff, the new ninja being more in the mirror's favor, Blitz stressing about the possibility of being replaced, Kai and Jay questioning the future of the team. Such a violent display of emotions is unbefitting a team. Then maybe we shouldn't even be a team anymore! Consider this my resignation letter! And the ninja on the run from the police for breaking the law a bunch of times, surely that would have a huge payoff for part two. Or maybe just cut those story threads entirely if you're not gonna go anywhere with them? Hell, even the ninja on the run subplot from Skybound, while a bit rushed, had a more satisfying payoff. Part 1 had so much buildup with the new versus old thing, and then part 2 rolls around and it gets crystallized, no pun intended. I said before that part 1 made it seem like the ninja would inevitably retire after part 2, and since I'm talking about this now, I'm going to do something that I immediately regret doing, and if what I'm saying next feels like I'm trashing Tommy or the writers, I apologize in advance. That's not what I'm trying to do, but here it is. Let's talk about how I would have ended Crystallized. If I were writing part two, I would obviously keep the Overlord, Crystal Council, and Vengestone Army plot points the same, but I would also change the apocalyptic portion up. All right, when we get to the city fallen under attack, the new ninja would try to fight off the Crystal Warriors like normal, but the Teal Ninja, the leader of the group, gets crystallized or he sacrifices himself in a big dramatic way to get crystallized, and the rest of his team save Mere Trustable, and they all eventually get to the warehouse where the other ninja and the remaining citizens are. I would also have Hound Dog McBrag and a few other police officers, even the commissioner, in the warehouse too. So with the new ninja, trustable Hound Dog, the commissioner, in the warehouse with the ninja, they start getting into an argument about the events of part one, and then trustable orders them to be arrested. They refuse and stand with them, mutually agreeing that there is more at stake and help them reach out to their allies just like normal. And then when the Crystal Council attacks the warehouse, the new ninja, the police, hound dog, and a reluctant trustable get shining moments in the battle. Crystal Council gets more shining moments as well, but when the Overlord arrives to finish everyone off, the Council, especially Pythor, realize that they were pawns and then join Harumi, Lloyd, and Garmadon in their fight against the Overlord. Then in her final moments, Aspira makes amends with Wu, maybe her last breath being avenge us or something. Vangelis also reconciles with Vaughn and Garmadon also dies for real. And then during the final battle, Lloyd sacrifices himself to kill the Overlord, the Vengestone army, and restore balance. You could also include a scene where Lloyd is shown to be in the grasslands, and this time he takes the first Minjutsu Master's hand, calling back to season 10. Or you could just have the gold petals floating around. As for the ending, they can still show them rebuilding the monastery, but everyone mourns Lloyd, the rest of the ninja retire, the new ninja either take their place, or Pixel and Skylar form a new team. Rumi answers for what she's done, faces a little jail time, and Wu looks out in the sunlight with Christopher in the final shot as a final tribute to Garmadon, and the story ends there. I know that's a lot to unpack and probably too much for 11 minute episodes, but it would have worked better if these episodes returned to its 22 minute runtime. Duration issues aside, this ending would have given closure for both the new ninja as well as the ninja versus the law arcs as well as give more shining moments from the c**k. Aspira, Pythor, and Vangelis especially would have had better send-offs. And while it would have been a much sadder and darker ending, it also allows the season to have stakes and more emotional impact. 
but the most important thing about my version is that it wraps up everything that part 1 set up while looking forward to the new stuff. And again, this is just how I would have wanted Crystallize to go down, but I know that's probably not what a lot of people would have wanted. And like I said, this is not my intention to trash Tommy or the creators, and if you are going to feel the need to trash them, do not. Like, stop it. Just be grateful with what they have given us for so far. And just be nice to people, be nice to them, do not feel the need to, like, harass them and tell them, oh, this is not the ending that I wanted. Yeah, that's not how it works. Like I said, I'll be fine with what we got and then some if 2023 jumps forward into it different time period but i'm very curious to know why they chose the and they all lived happily ever after ending and maybe then i'll respect the decisions more and while we're talking about creators, I just have to give a huge thank you and a round of applause for Tommy Andreessen, Dan and Kevin Hageman, Breggy Should, and the rest of the showrunners. If you told me from 2011 that this LEGO-themed TV show would have gotten 15 seasons and two TV specials all in the span of 11 years, I would have laughed at you. It's astounding to even consider how far they've come and how much they've accomplished. Of course, not everything was executed the best, but the fact that a show based on a LEGO theme assembled an entire franchise that even surpassed Adventure Time as the longest running show on Cartoon Network is just jaw-dropping, and it really shows how much care they put into making it. And of course, that is in large part because of the fans. I have my own personal issues with fan bases, but I have to give this one credit for keeping Ninjago alive even after Season 2, which is originally going to be the series finale. But it seems like it's not ending anytime soon, and I'm all for it. This season was probably satisfying for some of you, and probably a disappointment for others. We each have individual things that just scream Ninjago to us, and not every story has those exact things. But either way, the fact that we got 15 freaking seasons and two TV specials as of now is just worth recognition. Hell, we even got a movie based on this franchise, even though it takes place in a universe where everything is awesome. I cannot thank the voice actors, writers, creators, sound designers, and everyone else involved in making this franchise enough. And the fact that I'm a 21-year-old dude who still watches a show aimed for kids says something. Probably says that I'm immature and I need a new hobby, but I've got plenty of hobbies at my disposal. And now that we have a new series coming out next year, I want to give Tommy and Briggy a proper farewell for everything they've done. We'll miss you both. And Jaga won't be the same without you, but I'm excited to see what the new ringleaders will cook up next year. Speaking of 2023, some of you guys have been curious to know what I think of that. I obviously have no clue about what's going to happen, but the fact that it won't be considered Season 16 makes me perk up. One of the main things that I'm hoping to see happen is for Ninjago to get out of its comfort zone and start spreading out and getting away from the ninja. There's just so much lore and backstory that I think it would be refreshing to see more of the world through different eyes. Whether that be through the eyes of their allies or a new generation of ninja, anything works. I've been comparing Ninjago to the MCU and Star Wars, and while it's not as big or as popular, I've said before that it's big enough that it should follow a similar route and start expanding rather than treading the same ground with the same characters. From a storytelling perspective, you'll start to run out of things to say with them and people will start to lose interest. And from a behind the scenes perspective, I'm sure the voice actors want to do other things with their lives. And I have a lot more to say about 2023, but I'm saving that for a separate video. But basically, like, uh, like, I'm just, like, ready to see, like, a new set of characters. Like, shows need to end. Like, everybody's so concerned with, like, oh, we don't want to, like, abandon the characters that we've known or were introduced to in the series. And, like, just, they can just take the same IP and just tell a different story within the universe, but with different characters. Just, just do that, like, spinoffs or like sequels that aren't like direct sequels. Yeah, just do that or even prequels. Why not do that? Again, I'll talk more about that in another video. Overall, I thought Crystallized was fine. Is it my favorite season? Well, I did say in my Q&A video that it was, but that was before part two came out. So now I think I'm gonna retract my statement. It's not my favorite season, but I think it was good or okay. Again, part two kind of like tanked my overall appreciation for it. Again, my biggest issues were the way it handled some of its setups and payoffs, um, some storylines that they kind of glossed over, and it's very, way too squeaky clean finale. Is it the showrunner's best work? It's debatable. Best Ninjago season? Probably not in my opinion, but I can't deny how beautiful it looked. Again, loved the production value and care that went into it. I just think the writing had a lot of issues. But anyway, can't wait to see what's in store for next year. Up next, there are a lot of things. Uh, up next is more videos. <clears throat> 
My 2023 predictions video is going to be a pretty big one. I'm also going to go back into making Photoshop videos, some Ninjago related, some not. And speaking of, this wallpaper could use some revision, and I'll leave a download link this time. I've also written a script about the complete timeline of the Ninjago series up to 2022, so I might get to that before New Year's. And I also have that fanfiction that I need to get writing to. Actually, I've come up with a lot of fanfictions, and most of them are related to Ninjago. So yeah, obviously I have a crap ton of projects in mind, and you'll see each of them at some point in the future. But for now, leave a like, and hit subscribe, and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Also, let me know what you guys think of Season 15 and the 2023 series in the comments section. I am dying to hear your opinions. Have it just keep it civil. And as always, I will see you in the next video. See you next time.